Welcome to Women in Sustainability Stories series. We are here again on our Women in Sustainability Stories. And today we are honored to have with us a very remarkable guest who has been doing extremely well within the climate space and sustainability. Um, Doreen, Doreen, Emanuela Doreen Kofi is a lawyer and a climate change activist, as well as a climate negotiator. Her legal role focuses on environmental integrity and intergenerational equity. In 2022, she participated in COP27 as a volunteer, as a volunteer for the UNNFCC, which earned her a certificate of volunteering by UNFCCC. Emanuela was selected by the American Field Society to represent Ghana in the 2023 International Youth Day celebration at the UN headquarters in August 2023. As a climate negotiator, she negotiates on behalf of Ghana during COP28 held in Dubai, specifically on Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. And um, I mean, we have here right here with us, and she's going to tell us more about herself and um the activity she does within the climate space. So before we start, we want to say a very big thank you. We want to acknowledge our supporting partners. That's 10 Billion Ghana Hub, Wiki Update, Wiki Green Initiative. If you haven't followed us yet on Women for Sustainability Africa, kindly do follow us on our social media handles. You'll find us on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on IG, that's Instagram, and on X as Women for Sustainability Africa and W4S Africa. So, Emanuela, thank you so Hi. much for being here with us today. Um, we know we have so much to learn from you because you're full of knowledge. <laughs> so, would you, the conversation is yours. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so as um she rightly read my profile, so I'm Emanuela Doreen Kofi, and I'm a lawyer in Ghana, as well as a climate activist and a climate negotiator. And um, well, my sustainability story is it's quite interesting, and it runs back all the way back to twenty seventeen when I had my um I had my first volunteering opportunity with um, an organization that was, I mean, you know, um, hold, hosting a conference on the Legon campus. And I saw the link for, I mean, the in school studying, 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 experience, life on campus and it was me seven as an usher during the conference and it was so inspiring for me like mm -hmm. because I got to contribute to contribute to something bigger. I was helping people find their seats, helping people locate washrooms and all of that. Although at that time it seemed um or maybe telling the story now it may seem something little that oh you were just you know directing people to their cities, not anything major, but that's the beginning of my story. And right from there, I was very fortunate to encounter um, a mentor, Mother Renam Fuga. She really helped me. She's been instrumental in this journey, right? She literally, I just told her that if she hears of any volunteering opportunities, um, she should um, mean, um, tell me about it and also any organization that I can volunteer with. And she linked me up to about two or three organizations. And from there, I was, you know, volunteering for beach cleanups, volunteering for donation drives, you know, taking up various roles and all of that. And throughout that journey, I had opportunity to be trained as an SDG ambassador by the major group for children and youth. So um, that's also an, a UN organization under U UNEP. So when you see um, that kind of opportunity, most SDG ambassadors today can't even show certification for it, but I was fortunate. And, for, and unfortunately for some of my colleagues, right after that training, they never did that particular SDG ambassador training again. So I still have my certificates from them. And the training also helped. So it's been a learning journey for me throughout these six years. And um, 
I must say that um, one, seeing my mentor meeting here was very instrumental because you always need someone to guide you, right? And although she seems like, she's not like a, a grown up, like an older person. I mean, or oh, there's no age gap between she and I, just about like two years different. But I still recognize that she had so much experience in the space and she could share it with me. So from beach cleanups to all of these volunteering activities, um, I landed my first international volunteering opportunity in um, 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 2022 during COP27 in Egypt. And during that time, UNFCCC is the UN Organization for Climate Change. And um, volunteering for them at this big conference was a huge opportunity for me. And I realized that all the little volunteering, the ushering thing, you know the funny thing? In my volunteering with UNFCCC, I was placed in a dome, like a conference hall, and I was an usher there. Like, it's like going back to my youth, my very first volunteering opportunity was ushering at a conference. And in this first international volunteering opportunity, I was an usher there. And I realized that all my experiences in Ghana, the little, little volunteering that I've done, all those experiences shaped where I was today. And I was able to deliver the job like perfectly well because I knew how to relate with people. I knew how to deal with different people from different backgrounds with different attitudes and all of that. And also scanning a room full of participants for a conference, the various needs, you know, and um, helping people out with that. Even when someone is being rude, you have to, you know, stand your ground and still be nice with language barriers. They can't speak your language. Some people can't speak English. They speak French and all of that. So you would have to adopt to using, you know, sign language, not as in like sign language for, you know, deaf people, but just directing people using your hands and all of that, just to assist them because really they are not interested in understanding your language. They just need the help to be able to assess a particular place that they need to assess. So all of these have been, I mean, that's how my volunteering journey has been. It's been a learning process for me. And I finally got into the climate change space because I was already volunteering for um, beach cleanups, you know, tree planting exercises. So throughout all of that, when I go, I don't just sit in the conference or the program or just volunteer. I make sure that whatever that is being taught, the technical knowledge about the subject matter, I learn about it. So through all of these, then I said, okay, um, let me see how, what is in it for me in the climate space. And with my first volunteering for UNFCCC at the conference, so many topics went on in the conference room. And some of them I'd never even heard of, like they were so technical, but I took note of them that when I come back to Ghana, I would research on them and read about it. So that's how I got to learn about the UNFCCC process and um, working with my organization, Grand Hedge International, which is an NGO based in Ghana. Um, I'm a director for legal affairs for that organization. And we basically focus, our focus areas are four. So we have the wash, so water and sanitation, we also focus on climate smart agriculture. We also focus on education, increasing access to climate education and knowledge. And then also energy where we focus on clean cooking for us and technology, making sure that most communities in Ghana and, and even beyond have access to clean cooking for us and technology. So that has been really my journey in the climate space. And here I am today. Wow. <laughs> amazing amazing so um looking at your focus area having to do um clean cooking um agricultural smart you said um climate smart that, agriculture that right? watch can you just give us a brief summary of what each each has to do okay so starting with wash so when it comes to wash it has to deal with water and sanitation so um you look at um the challenges that various communities are facing when it comes to water and sanitation. Plastic waste management is part of WASH because it has to do with sanitation and how that is polluting our environment. When it comes to water, to access to clean, access to clean water, um, you, you realize that most communities don't have that and even access to clean drinking water because some people have access to water but it's not clean for consumption i carried um, a project out a project in the water region of ghana very remote in fact it's like an island locked behind the lagoon it's called Fenito, and we we went there and realized that they were drinking directly from the lagoon with all of the 
uh, pollutants ended directly, whether you were a newborn baby, that was what they had access to. They had no other ways of, you know, purifying that water. That's what they drank. That's what they used to wash. That's what they bathed with. And you realize that that was a very major problem because it was causing them a lot of health problems. And they don't have any facilities in the community, whether schools, village, um, um, hospitals, or, you know, all of those amenities that you need for a sustainable community. They had none. So what we did was to um, go to the community and donate um, um, a polytank to them and then also provide them with alum and train them on how to, you know, um, pump the water directly from the lab on in the, and then treat the water with alum before they could drink. So that is like, just to give you an example of what a wash project looks like. And then when it comes to the Climate Smart Agriculture, this is still on inception phase whilst we are looking at... Um, looking at how we can improve the agricultural sector using um, 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 technology and then also how we can improve um, climate change with that because we realize that there's something called agroecology. Most of the time, um, um, p um, farmers use you know all these fertilizers that are polluting the soil because it ends up making the soil lose its fertility, um, fertility right? So one of the climate smart agriculture um, thing that we do is like we use solar panels right to um, facilitate irrigation in these farms especially in the northern region where the rainfall pattern is very um, unsupportive of like um, continuous agriculture throughout the year so you realize that that's what some of the things that we do on that side and then when it comes to education we make sure that young people especially um, 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 young people especially have uh, knowledge about climate change, right? All the aspects of climate change and they really understand it so that they will develop the interest to be able to also champion um, climate advocacy. So one of the projects we've done under that is the International Clean Cooking Ambassador's Training Program, which we hosted in 2023, where we had about 400 young people from across Africa being trained on um, sustainable development goals, the various targets for all the 17 goals, and then um, clean cooking, um, um, clean cooking as a part of, you know, um, access to energy or clean energy and um, how it is related to climate change, you know, the um, connection or the synergies between clean cooking and um, climate change and even other sustainable development goals. That was what the training was about. And we gave them um, certificates and afterwards, we are going to upgrade that training program into a fellowship this year where all these ambassadors will now be connected to um, organizations or companies championing clean cooking in their country so that they can understudy them and see how they can also contribute to the fight for clean energy when it comes to the clean cooking force and technology space. So um, basically, and when it comes to the last one, which is energy, we are focused on clean cooking force again. And what we are doing is that currently we are um, having the She Blue Initiative, which is a project in co um, collaboration with MasterCard Foundation, where we are doing it currently in the central region of Ghana. That's the KEA district, Komenda, Eguafo, Edna, and then Ibrim. And the project here is to provide clean cooking force to the, and technologies to the community. And that clean cooking force that we are focusing on is turning alcohol. There's a lot of sugarcane plantation and commander. So we tend that they use it for, um, you know, alcohol for drinking, but you can also um, process that alcohol and then gel it so that it becomes a fuel for cooking where you can, you know, light it up and you can use it to cool, uh, to cook. It comes with its own special technology. So with this project, we are setting up a plant or a factory where they would do the production. And this is, it involves women. So that is our gender policy. It involves lots of women and then young people to provide them with income because when they finish with the production they will sell it and then the money generated will go into their pockets where they can use it to support their children's education buy sanitary parts and all of that so that is basically our focus areas and the various things we are doing under all of that as an organization so that's what grand hedge international is doing currently lots of yes. amazing stuff right here Right. So, so just bringing in the gender bits of, of the whole project, what has been some of the challenges um, you have faced personally and you think some of the challenges that um, this woman in focus have also encountered in driving sustainability? And how okay. have you been able to um, overcome some of these challenges? 
Yes. Yeah, so the first thing I'll say is that climate change is a very technical space. Very technical. It goes beyond doing beach cleanups and you know, talking, talking, talking. It's very technical. You need to sit your ass down and really learn it. And because it's science, it's first a science before all of this. Because if you don't understand the climate sign, you will not even be a good advocate for it. So and because most of the time it stems from the stereotype where when it comes to STEM, so science and technology courses or I mean issues or fields of study, it's left for men because it's too technical. There are so many mathematics and different aspects of it. But that's the first challenge. So you find most women not being interested in it because they'll tell you it's too technical. If if you really want to sit down and learn climate change, it's very technical. The science, the technologies the jargons and all of that. So that's one aspect. But for me, I love learning and I was very determined to increase my, I mean, advance in my climate change um, or climate activism. So I sit down, You, if you come see me, I don't have any exams, I don't have nothing, but I always plan that if there's a new topic, I Google it, go to YouTube, there are so many videos and then I sit my eyes down and learn. That's one of the major challenges because you need time to sit down and study the science behind it before you can become a good advocate for whichever aspect of climate change that you are advocating for. And that is one of the challenges that I would say faces most young women in the space because finding the time and even developing the interest to sit down and say, okay, I'm a climate activist. They don't even know about the Paris Agreement and what goes into it, right? And all the various parts of the Paris Agreement that even relates to what you are doing. And you can't just wake up and advocate when you don't know. So that's one of the challenges. Another one is, I'm working with the men in the space. I'm a strong feminist, and sometimes you are undermined because I feel like they have all the experiences, they have all the energy, all the knowledge. Their opinions are always right, but we need lots of women to be in the space so that even when we are developing solutions, climate smart solutions, you realize that we can look at it from the women's perspective and how it affects that. But statistics are shown that when um, most women, according to UN, when most women and children are the ones that are mostly affected by climate um, change related issues and disasters. So we really need a lot of women to be in this space. And for me, one of the challenges that I also had in the climate space, I have a mentor for my legal career, but when it comes to the climate change space, you really really find someone guiding you, like holding your hands and saying that, okay, do this and that, and then also showing you, like sharing opportunities with you, mentioning your name in rooms that you are not in, all jet towards like helping you advance in your career. So well, it's, it, that is also the challenge. But recently I was very excited when the um, CDKN is one organization that focuses on knowledge sharing and they had this she dialogue where um, so many, um, climate activities, only women were in that room and we had mentors who were women sharing their journeys with us. Those are some of the things that like, um, we really need in a climate space to um, support young women who are championing climate action. Because sometimes the journey gets tough. You are there and then you have your own career. I have to go to court, do all of those things and equally divide my time to also be carrying out projects when it comes to climate change space. Even when you travel for, international conferences it's not all glossy and fun because you've left work back at home and when you come they'll all be piling up waiting for you so all the stress that comes with all of these things is some of the things that we need mentors who have advanced in this space to help us out with so those are some of the challenges that we face and even financial challenges when you find women leading ngos trying to carry out projects you need money for it and it's very difficult having access to that money you go to you know, all of these big people for money. And I will, I will not be shy to say some of them will want to get into your pants. M many people will think that you are exaggerating or things, but it's something that I've faced, right, personally. And it's it's one of the, you need a resilient mindset to navigate through all of those challenges. But not everyone is as resilient and has had much experiences to be able to, you know, um, deal with those challenges. So those are some of the things that general challenges we, we face as women. Um, who are climate activists, yeah. So yeah, I think that is it about that part. Yeah, these, these are real um challenges. So I was just wondering, in your pro the projects that you had in um Volta region as well, did you encounter anything about like a cultural challenge as well? Yeah, we always face the cultural challenge because one, there's language barrier. 
Um, secondly, the people are used to what they are used to. So you, if you are bringing something new to them, you have to break it down and then language they understand using examples that is everyone like can relate to so that they can buy into the idea. But what we did was that we didn't just go and start a project there. We had something called a volunteer. So we sort of, we don't go there to do any project, we just visit the community, have conversations with them, meet with the community leaders, and you ask them what their challenges are in the community. When they tell you what the challenges are, and then you ask them what are some of the solutions they would want to see. So they'll tell you both the problem and the solution. Then you navigate through the problems and the solutions they've shared with you, what the organization aligns with and what they can do to help them. So even if you have a project that is not related to what they're like, the current challenges and problems they are facing, you can pick one of the challenges, provide a solution for it, and then attach what you want to um, bring into the community so that there'll be more welcoming because they know that this is a long-standing problem they've had, and then you are bringing them solutions to it, and they'll be more than willing to you know, support you and embrace the solution you are bringing. So yeah, that's that's it about that. Great. So how do you think some of these challenges we can overcome? We're looking at, um, you didn't mention about financials, you didn't mention about how technical the climate space was. What can we do as women to really penetrate through that space and break the barrier? Yeah, so it, it first starts with researching and learning, right? Because we have so many ideas. We have so many ideas. But the thing is that if you don't learn about the challenges, you really can't know which idea is per perfect, right? So let's say you are looking at um, um, climate education. You can't just go and say, I'm coming to teach you about clean cooking. No, they don't even know about clean cooking and all of that. But when you go talk to them, you make them try to understand. So you ask them, how has the weather been? Is the way the sun shining? Has it been the same for them throughout the five years or the past 10 years? Then they'll let you know that, oh, it was always cool on this region. But recently, the temperatures are rising. And then so, they are facing so much flooding and all of that. Then you ask them, why, why do they think they are facing these issues? So they'll even be able to tell you what you know as a like a technical aspect of climate change in their own language, just that they don't know it is related to climate change. So finding that information, we then piece um put the pieces together for them, for them to know that oh, it's because of these emissions that we are releasing into the atmosphere. It's because of this plastic waste pollution that you are facing this challenge. You like you, 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 it's like a puzzle. They have knowledge, definitely you will never go to any community where they don't know why they are facing the issues that they are facing. But they don't know that it's related to climate change or it's even a danger to their health or it's even a problem. They just know that it's something that is occurring. So you have to really learn as a young woman who wants to penetrate the space, sit down, learn about climate change. If it is energy, you want to go learn about it. And then when you go to communities, try and listen to them more and then try and speak to them in a language they understand. Don't go to them with all these terminologies. They will not understand. They will, it will seem far they just try and then speak to them in a language they understand. Be more welcoming to them. Try and understand the challenges that they are facing. And with that, when you come back, you know that, okay, this is one challenge. And you already understand the SDG. So you realize that, okay, I can do something related to gender equality in the same project. I can do something related to, you know, increasing access to finance or something. I can do something related to climate change. So that's when you have a very good project proposal whereby most funding organization will be interested to fund you. But if you don't know about it, you just pick one aspect of the problem. By the time you are done with the, pro the project, another problem is even emerging out of the project that you did because it was not sustainable. You didn't look at it from a 360 degree I mean, I mean, angle. So that's what I can say about that. Hmm. Wow, I, I think that's that's very we need to really take our time and, and learn. I think it's it's really the learning for me as well as um, having a mentor to to guide you in, in that process because if not you can get lost within this climate yeah. climate space, right? You don't even know your left from your right. So we really need to be interested in um learning. So for you, what's what what advice would you have for anyone who is interested? in um getting into the sustainability space climate change i mean like you know who is who wants to do environmental and especially to the young girls the ladies out there the women even the elderly women what information do you have for them okay so on that side i'll just 
that this answer on the premise that I have so many people coming to me that oh, I want to be a climate activist, share opportunities with me and all of that. But when they come, I, when you share learning opportunities with them, they don't want to go. They just see you traveling around the continent and or the world and they think that oh, climate change, they come to traveling around, but they really don't know the stress and the journey like you've gone through to get to that space. So I think that first you should have an interest in learning. There's no harm in learning because you can't start something when you don't have knowledge about it. To so try and find opportunity, learning opportunities, right? So when there's a conference, there are so many conferences by GAIO, by SYND, by Youth Climate Council, even Women for Sustainability Africa, the online trainings and the physical trainings you hold. They are all platforms for um, us all to learn um, about climate change and about sustainability and even how technology relates to sustainability. And when you attend all those programs, not just to attend and take pictures, take notes, right? Which new areas, what did they mention that you don't understand? Where you go, Google always provides the answer for you. There's too much information. And that is what our generation have as an advantage, access to technology, access to the internet. So make use of that. Dedicate your time that, okay, every day at least, I have to dedicate one hour of my time to learn something new about climate change, about the space that I want to go into. So that's one. The second aspect is that as a, um, as a, um, um, I mean, a beginner in this space, you don't just go and say, well, I want to be in energy. You might not know what opportunities that lies ahead of you. So try and have an understanding of all the aspects of climate change, plastic waste management, water, oceans, you know, the blue economy, agriculture, try and have knowledge as to all of that. So when you finish and then you realize that, okay, the opportunities that are coming your way, you know, are gearing towards energy, then you focus your attention on that. But that doesn't mean that you focus all your attention on that. And then when an opportunity on an agriculture, synergies between agriculture and energy comes your way, you can't do it because you only have knowledge on one aspect of it. So that is what I can say. And you really don't need money to thrive in this space. I don't have any money, but we are going ahead because it's all about experiences. If you get international opportunities, if you want to get all of these traveling things, they want experience. What have you done? If you see all of these applications that come, they will ask you to share your CV, to share your experiences, ask you essay questions on your experiences that you have on and uh, you've had on a particular topic. And these experiences will come from your volunteering activities. You, have, you need to dedicate your time. I spent my own money. You spend your own money on transport, be a volunteer. They'll not even give you food or anything, but you still go every day because you know what you're looking out of it, you know the experiences and the knowledge you want. And a time will come, you will not face those challenges again because you would have had so much experiences and so many organizations will be calling for your expertise. So that's one of it. And then if you find someone sharing opportunities with you, try and attend them. I've had people that share opportunities with them. They say they want to, they will worry you, but they share opportunities with them and they don't even go. They don't even go for the, those conferences. They don't even join those webinars. Even webinars that are you know, remote, you can join from your phone and just learn, you don't join. And I'm like, how do you want to learn if you don't take, I mean, or if you don't make use of all these opportunities that we are share, sharing with you to build your knowledge on it. So that's all I can say, that you really need to make um, a determined effort that I really want to get this thing right. And just like the way you want to pass your exams in school and you learn and take tests and all of that, use the same zeal and energy to, you know, towards your um, um, interesting climate action and how we can get to the top. So that's all I can say. Oh, Emanuela, you've been awesome. So, so awesome. So before I let you go, can you tell us you are a negotiator on behalf of Ghana? You know, you can you tell us a little bit of, about that? Can anyone just be a negotiator? Can anyone just attend COP? Like, can you give us um, details? Okay, so being a negotiator, well, um, I mean, in the legal space, I already do advocacy and all of that, and I've studied international environmental law and all of that, but um, being a negotiator is like a special skill. Anyone can be a negotiator, but once again, you need to study it, right? So I had opportunity um, um, with Youth Climate Council Ghana, where I saw an, I mean, a call for applicants for their youth negotiator training, so I applied and by God's grace, I was selected. So through the training, um, we were trained on the UNFCCC processes, the PARI agreement, the various negotiation tracks, what goes on the practical aspects of negotiations when you go for COP. And then um, out of us, 
um, out of that training, about four of us were selected by UNICEF Ghana. We're being funded by UNICEF Ghana. So we're funded to go for COP28 as negotiators. So when we got there, we're all shared across um, different negotiating tracks. So I was focusing on Article 6, which is on carbon markets. And so I followed the negotiation tracks and realized that everyone can be a negotiator, really. But the thing is that in the climate space, not we need people that would do the projects. We need people that would, you know, even have ballot at COP. I'm talking about doing the COP. It's not all of us that will be in the so many people were at COP, but um not all of them were following the negotiation track because we also needed people to have bilateral relations with other countries to look for money for projects and all of that. But for the negotiator side, we also need people to be in the negotiating on the negotiating table because whatever that happens on the grounds is as a result of all the international decisions that are made. So if they say that, okay, no money should be invested in, um, what, what do I say, in plastic waste pollution and all of that, then you'll be looking for grants for your plastic um, waste um, pollution projects and you're not getting, because that's as a result of what happened on the international level. So we need people being at the negotiating table and then also on grounds during the project. And, I realized that the role of young people on the negotiating tables because it, it helps us understand what goes on there so that we don't criticize the leaders from a point of you know ignorance. But when we are saying something, we know that okay, lots of things went on at the negotiating table. And this is what came out of all of those negotiations. And it also helps you to be part of the decision making process because if you're a negotiator, you get to speak, you get to, you know. Uh, make suggestions and all of those things and it's part of the process so that's all I can say about the negotiation anyone that is interested you need to be trained it's not just um there are so many before copy see so many applications for negotiators training and all of that if you see one you can apply if you get selected that's your journey towards being a climate negotiator but also the youth climate council holds their training every year so you can be looking out on their page their instagram page or telegram and when they post it, you apply. And if you get selected, that would be your journey towards being a climate negotiator. Yes. Okay. And, and what about the COP? How do you get to attend COPs? Can anyone also go? Anyone can go for COP, but you need accreditation. And accreditation comes from CSOs or from your government agencies. So if you get accreditation, the next thing is funding. You need your flight, your accommodation, your per diem. And that's most of the challenges that we, we, we face, especially for those of us in sub-Saharan Africa. But there are so many, before COP, you see so many applications. But you will only get selected once again, back to experience and what you've done. So you don't just wake up and you're not contributing to any climate change and you want an organization to fund you. In the application, they ask you what are your experiences when you go for COP, what are you going to contribute? That's why throughout the year, from January all the way, to be for COP, you build your capacity, contribute to a project, bring change, make impacts. So that when you do the application, you have a story to tell. And then definitely one of the applications will fall through and then you get the funding to go. So really that's a challenge, getting accreditation and then the funding to go for COP. Oh, okay, great. That's, that's a good information right there. So um, I know you did mention of um, the opportunities. Can you just hammer on it? So which sites uh, would you recommend for um, learnings and other opportunities like these if someone is actually interested? So what I start with is following all of these organizations on social media. So if you're in Ghana, EPA has a website, Youth Climate Council has a website, um, Gayo, I mean, they have Instagram or social media apps pages so follow all of them right um even women for sustainability you have to make sure that all the organizations that are in the climate space and the people that you've seen on tv or on, at programs that are in the climate space follow them because they share opportunities on their pages and that is how you can start on the international level yango is also one of them you can apply to join yango just google yango that that's the youth wing for the unf people see so when you sign up onto their mailing list so many opportunities are shared on their mailing list so you apply for it um you, you get added to their um how do i say the, their youth um i mean when that's young with their website their mailing list and then all those opportunities come and there's also the um children and then major, major um, um um children and i think you something under the UN, unip I, I have to cross check it but 
UNEP, that's the United Nations Environmental Program, they also have a youth wing where when you subscribe to their mailing list, they even have WhatsApp groups and all of that. You can join and opportunities are shared there. So that's how it begins following on social media so that when the opportunities come, you'll be able to see. There are also websites like Opportunity Tracker where you can I mean, um, follow their website. They put so many international opportunities, not just for climate change, but for other opportunities, scholarships and all of that where you can also um, make use of. So that's all I can say about where to find all of these opportunities. That's great. Um, I'm sure many will jump on to the website and follow all the social media handles. Mm -hmm. And don't forget to follow um, Women for Sustainability Africa as well. So all be your final last words. Final last words. We're ending. So my last few words would be that um, climate change is broad. We need so many hands on deck because of the issues we are facing. We need so many young people to take interest in it. So just start. Don't panic from where you are going to begin. Start with something. Start. I mean, just start, and you realize that from one opportunity to the other, your path will be aligned, and you get to the space where you are so sure that this is the part of climate change you want to champion. And so many opportunities will come to your way, but be ready to put in the hard work. There's no room for me to pretty over here. We, we just need to put in the hard work and don't compare yourself to anyone. Don't look at someone that, oh, they are traveling all over the world, so you want to be there. Just make sure that you um, have all of the um, necessary, um, how do I say, the motivation that you need. That is all you need. What is in your mind? How determined are you to thrive in this space? And then also when you are given the opportunity, don't mess it up. Someone gives you an opportunity to go and speak at a program or attend a program and you go mess it up, then you lose that kind of opportunity that you had the last time. So when you, any opportunity, whether little or big, make sure you make the most out of it and you will not know who is watching. So I wish us all the best and I really hope that um, we get to see us improve each and every year in our climate activism. Thank you so much, Anita, for this opportunity. Thank you oh, so much. You're so, so, you so welcome. Much. Lawyer Emmanuel Dorin Kofi, we are very pleased to have had you on today's show. We are so happy and thank you so much for the time spent with us. It's been very educative and very, very insightful, honestly. Um, I'm sure lots of other people will want you as a mentor. So, I mean, <laughs> why, why not? Some, I'm sure Emmanuel can equally make time for anyone who is interested in, you know, getting into the sustainability. Let's just be ready to learn. So, cancel. Thank you so, so much. We really do appreciate your, your time. So our supporting um, partners, we are so grateful to Wiki Green Conference, Wiki Update, 10 Billion Strong, Ghana Hub. We are so very grateful. Don't forget to follow us on all our social media handles, Women for Sustainability Africa on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Instagram, on X. We are there. Just get in touch with us. And we'll be there to support you as well. Thank you. You may also Google us. Um, I think when you type in W4S, you'll find us on our website as well. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.